Will it repeat? Welcome to the Get Offset Podcast. My name is Andrew. And my name is Emily, and I turned up the volume on that intro at the very end. <laughs> you did, uh, which good. kind of spoils our, our starting show. Uh, uh, is Andrew drinking coffee or is Andrew drinking whiskey? Yeah, but with the volume spike, we know it's just coffee because it didn't really affect me much. Okay. I'm trying. I do, I don't I don't even know what I okay let's just move on from it it didn't <laughs> land let's just all right keep moving let's just keep 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 moving so just keep uh, swimming just keep just swimming. keep swimming uh yeah I've heard I've heard of that um damn I don't I don't know what to start with this week honestly uh that is. Man, I feel like I'm slowly climbing out from underneath the rock after like a couple of months of being under a rock. There's not there's not a different way to say that without sounding more redundant. But yeah. This week felt like a month. So much happened this week. Both like in the world and in my my life. So <sighs> my stress dreams are returning. So uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Dude, even when I like so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I take Zola off, so I don't have, like, big panic attacks mm-hmm. anymore. I still, like, have dreams where I'm having a panic attack in the dream. It's weird. That is strange. Uh, I've, like, the last couple months have just been so stressful. I feel like I haven't really dreamt a whole lot. Yeah. Um, which maybe my body's just like, nope, you're good. You're too stressed to deal with it. We'll just let you sleep. <laughs> and now my body's like, cool. So you're uh, finally starting to settle in. You're... Finding a little bit of what it's that a routine? But yeah, we're gonna have to play with that. And so I ended up snoozing a whole bunch this morning. Like I had the most insane. It was like it started off as like a really happy, like exciting dream. Like the CEO of Microsoft like decided to be like, here's a promotion. It'll kick in tomorrow as long as you don't tell anybody in the next 24 hours. And of cool. course, the next thing I did in my dream was like tell someone, but then tell them not to tell anyone. And then I just ended up like this in anxiety, anxious loop of like trying to damage control the uh, the don't tell anyone loop. So yeah. I would keep my job or else I would just get fired altogether. Has this been since we released the episode title, Andrew Has a Secret? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um, I mean, it has been since then, but I don't think it's related. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but that is funny. There, maybe I, is I'm funny. predicting my first. I predict a pandemic, and now I'm predicting my own dreams. Yeah, just stop making predictions. <laughs> um, it's like a it's like a reverse like cause dream. You're supposed to be like interpret your dreams, right? That's and then they predict some, the future. Some, some, well, not well. I've I've had hmm. dreams that seems to predict the future. I try not to read into that too much, but, uh, Some real no, there, there are definitely people Egypt who believe going on there. There are definitely people who think that you should interpret your dreams because they're like little windows into your soul. And it might be your subconscious trying to tell you something, but I'm not sure that's real science. It's fun. Definitely fun. Like astrology, but if it brings people joy and it's not harmful, yeah, but astro- I can't do astrology. It's not Christian. We'll just ignore the fact that, you know, the, the wise men found Jesus based on reading the stars. And they happen to be from a completely non Judea, um, like, com- you know, probably from like Ethiopia. And so we just kind of ignore that part. Anyways. Yeah, astrology is interesting because it's something that uh, uh, to stereotype a little bit, dudes especially like to shit on. And it's one of those things that's like, Okay, this is something that's clearly like predominantly enjoyed by women, and is it, it oh, astrology. It's there are definitely men who dig it, but it's pretty, pretty female fan base there. Yeah, I had the realization the other night that Melissa and I don't don't like. I don't know what Melissa's uh, um, astrology sign is, or I don't know what to call it. I'm a Taurus. And she's like, oh, I don't know yours either. What are you? I'm like, oh, I'm Scorpio, I think. And she's, she's like, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I really like talking about mine because, you know, people, you know, get the wrong wrong idea and whatnot. Um, 
Yeah. So I'm like, well, are you going to talk about it? She's like, yeah, I'll talk about it. Uh, I'm a Gemini. I'm like, oh, that's rather two-faced of you. <laughs> that's Rick's a real, a I'm not making this up. That's not a bit. That's a real conversation we had while we were doing dishes at like mm-hmm. 9 p.m. I'm sure it was very cute and funny. It was. <laughs> So I've got the I've got these new in ears from Ultimate Ears. Ooh. And I gotta say, like having a nice seal makes a makes a huge difference. <laughs> then like, never... I was using I was using these um these little Fender Boys. Yep. Which were fine for a while, but they didn't quite hold up. Like I've lost the plastic tip of this one. Mm. I've been using these in my demos for a long time and it uh, sucked. <laughs> uh, so it sucked. Can't say I've ever had seal. Imagine it's a little blubbery, but. Okay. That's enough. All right. We're done. <laughs> I'm, I'm Show's officially over. tired of Canceled. this. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's enough. That's really enough. It's too early for this. It's too early. So what else um, is new with you? And it's not even as early as we're going to record our next episode. Allegedly. Special guest from the East Coast. <laughs> I have um, a new friend. Whoa. I cannot be stopped. You cannot be stopped. Can't stop, won't stop. It is the Roadworn Ventura Telecaster. So you see some. Is, is it not Ventura? In there. Ventura. Sure, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> Got some buckle rash. Really tasteful, I think, uh, for the most part. Is it a poly like, finish? I don't care, dude. I care. Um, and then there's just like the weird, the weirdest wear is there's these little like holes right there. It looked like someone took a screwdriver and just went bap, 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 yep. bap. And I don't really know what that's supposed to be like recreating and far, as far as natural wear goes. Can you explain? Can you elucidate? Uh, you can't really see that. Would, would that not be like from like on your on your Levi's? You've got like little button here. No, uh, this is. I mean, that's a buckle rash, and that makes sense. Yeah, but this is like little like pop, 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 pop holes. Um. Yeah, I've, I mean, I, I I've seen that in guitars before. I've never really questioned it a whole lot. Uh, probably just stuff like rattling around in the case while it's on tour. I don't know. This feels very specific and very intentional. And there Maybe are very many of these string pokes. Uh, no, that's I'm like, I, I, I don't think to sh- it's just, uh, I'm curious. So if you're listening and you would know why there would be little indentations on the back of a telecaster near the string through bridge, uh, let me know. I actually haven't plugged it in yet because I just really just got it. Um, but it's got the wide range pickups. I need to get a little bit of goo gone on the the uh, the scratch plate there. That's patina. I think. Okay, you gotta stop. I'm tired. This is not funny. This is not fun for me. It's just I'm just trying to be serious about my guitar. This is serious. It's very serious. I think the wear is very tasteful is what I'm trying to say. I agree. I'm interested. I'm excited to plug it in. It has nines. I'm not used to like nines, but damn, they kind of make life a little bit easier, don't they? I personally play with nines. I know you do. I'm not saying anything bad about nines. I like, I'm enjoying playing. Them. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. So that's what's new with me. What's new with you? Well, I ordered some of the first parts for the parts caster, so that's starting to come together. Starting to- oh, is it, are these the parts that I'm already aware of? They are the parts you're already aware of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Andrew and I, um, we we saved ourselves uh, two shipping fees by getting a lot of stuff shipped uh, yep. to my place. So uh, when I, I think... Probably the next couple of weeks, they'll arrive and I'll have a chance to swing over and grab them. I can show them off. I'm very excited, though. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think when I hold the first like chunk of the parts caster in my hands, it's going to feel a lot more real. And it's going to give me that oomph to like, let's go. 
Yeah. Um, so that's new. Um, almost new. Outside of almost that, new. and that should that should be here really soon. So I hope it's not just sitting in my house for a couple of weeks. Right. Yeah, um, that'd be nice. Hopefully, in the next week, the wall behind me is getting painted. Uh, after okay. some deliberation and some very helpful thoughts from the um, from the patrons, we kind of settled in the direction of going towards a gray. So I'm waiting. Nice. I went to the hardware store and like, oh, sorry, we, we can't mix any paint because we're out of the base. For Oh, yeah, that happens. I'm like, oh, man. So going to have to go back in the next couple of days. I... I'm going to be out of the house a bunch later this week. So I've asked Melissa pretty, pretty please if she would help paint the wall because she's really good at painting. Well, mm-hmm. not. Nice. And he sneezes or coughs into his arm, dear listeners. Uh, at least I, I, I had the uh, awareness to mute that time. Yeah, that's always nice. I do appreciate that because I, I forget. I at the podcast, I'm like, damn, we sniffle a lot. Um, as far as gear goes, like I'm I'm just I feel like I'm finally starting to settle in the space a little bit. My desk is set up now. Um every, it, everything's networked. Um I've got some of my Fox Cairo equipment over there is plugged in for production. I've actually been able to make a handful of toppers this week. Um mm-hmm. get those out the door. Um yeah, I'm kind of just doing the whole, doing the constant like, okay, well, what's next? And I think the the what's next for me is trying to sort out what to do with the the wall behind me aside from painting it. So yeah. So here's what I know is I want to hang guitars on the wall. Uh huh. Want the wall to be gray because like all the other walls yeah. in this room are white, and so that'll reflect light nicely. But if I do any camera stuff on the back wall, it'd be helpful for like especially with the guitars with white binding for that to really mm-hmm. pop with the gray. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we've got like an, uh, a couch that we're thinking about putting there. Not sure if that's the play. Uh, not sure if we want to sort out I, what I really want to have is like, not, maybe not so like junky looking, but you know, like the pedal stations at guitar center, where they've yeah. got like the ISO five at the back and I'm kind of plugging with a couple of patch cables and amp underneath. I kind of yeah. want to sort something like that out. Um, I don't, if that's, probably going to be something that I'd have to make. So I can't imagine that's going to be something I'm going to find at like a Goodwill or something. Probably not. <laughs> you so can like, get like a little, there's, there. Ha- you have to be able to find like a little like tabletop lectern kind of thing. Something that like that. Like yeah. a little bit of an angle. So it's not so like, Oh, what am I doing here? I don't know. I don't know if yeah. I want that to be like the coffee table in the middle of the room. I don't know if I want to just put that against the wall and just the chair I'm sitting in is the chair for the room. I don't know yet. Um, lots of things. And you'll probably go through lots of iterations if my experience with staging a video set. And then of course I'm any- getting, I'm getting more inspiration in the mail. I don't even remember signing up for this. I think I have a Joan Jet. That is Joan Jet. She's um, such a badass. She is. So um, maybe I'll just flip through here for some inspiration. Speaking of guitar mm-hmm. center. <laughs> Yeah. I got a big Sweetwater catalog or something, and I started to piece through it, and I'm like, this goes in garbage now. Nah. Recycling. Um, I don't have a hamster, so, or a bird. I just, I put mine, <laughs> so Melissa got me something for my birthday last year, so now she gets them too, with her name on them. Oh, right. So now we get mm. two, and <laughs> so we've got two bathrooms, so now we've just got one in the magazine rack at each toilet. <laughs> oh nuts that's weird um hey if for those your phone dies i mean yeah hey for those listening do you shop at sweetwater or reverb.com check out the links in the video description or the show notes of this podcast when you're shopping and you help support this podcast it costs you zero extra dollars and it helps us a lot thank you for everyone who has used those links agreed huzzah Hooray! It pays for the hosting of the website and the podcast. Which I'm a fan of. Yeah. Yeah, I like not going out of pocket for for this 
beautiful hobby. It was fine when we were getting started. Mm. So that's, you know, the, the joy of getting started. But It makes it feel even better, though, now that that's not the necess- necessity. I agree. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Can I show you something? I suppose. So I've been, um, I spent a lot of yesterday with the Yvette Young signature guitar. And I actually, I tuned it even more out of standard tuning. So I could learn some of her songs. I'm not very good at it, but I've been practicing a lot and it was very hard to play at that angle. And I just got to say, I'm so lucky to have a, a partner who does not get upset when I just sit in the TV room and just play guitar riffs. I've been thinking about putting my acoustic out in the living room. We'll see. Once I stayed up late last night trying to plan out what the living room is going to be like. That sounds really good, by the way. Thank you. Rick listened to that for like literally three hours last night. Just put on put on some like Shark Tank. Put on mm. some. What else were we watching last night? Something that didn't have like a lot of music in the soundtrack. Like it's hard with Lifetime or MTV shows because there's all they have so much background music happening. But just, uh, you just, it's great improv practice. You got to vamp over the TV. Sometimes it's okay, but sometimes it's so distracting. Lifetime shows, and especially, will go for like they they lean so heavily into like soundscaping to mm. tell otherwise really boring stories sometimes <laughs> and yeah so th- like they, they're like people need to know what emotion to feel so now we're going to play some really ter- and sometimes what's what what makes it worse is that with the lifetime shows it's like distractingly bad stock music and there's not there's a lot of good stock music so i don't know why they're like fussing with the worst stock music i've ever heard but that seems to be the case yeah i mean yeah, it's a directorial. What's the word that I'm looking for there? Director's choice. Decision. Directorial decision. Directorial creative decision. decision. Creative decision. That sounds that sounds less clunky. I like that. Yeah, it's a creative choice. Storytelling, but uh, every, but Rick and I like watching uh, Married at First Sight. Uh, that's just one of our you know, guilty pleasures. And uh, he actually really likes it too. And he will get sad if I watch it without him. Uh, but it, sometimes like the stock music, it's like, okay, this is very obviously trying to sound like Bonnie Bear, or this is very obviously trying to sound like Bruno Mars. And that's always pretty funny. Like, oh, someone typed in Bonnie Bear to their stock, stock yep. photo, a uh, stock music website of choice. And they found something that sounded similar enough. I mean, it, music makes such a big difference uh, w- with with tracks. I, one of my favorite examples of that is there's the scene where Darth Vader's coming off the Imperial shuttle, uh, mm-hmm. and there's the the Admiral there waiting for him. And if you swap out the music from the Imperial March, like some like R and B like '90s, like let's get it on, suddenly like you start like the little, little things like the guys like standing there waiting, and he like starts to clear his throat, and it, it mm-hmm. completely changes the the way you interpret that body language. Um, yeah, and sometimes in like scary movies, they'll use like really sweet sounding music mm-hmm. to just make it seem even more psychotic. Sure. So the, so the toy piano dangerous. effect. It's a yeah, a little toy piano. Maybe put it through some reverb to make it sound like it's being played in an abandoned mall. Remember when that was like the big thing on YouTube? People would take like Toto songs and then mm-hmm. just EQ them and put weird plugins on them to make them sound like they were in abandoned malls. And people really liked that for about two weeks. Look, you got to do something when you're scrolling your phone at 3 a.m. And uh, that's prime entertainment. Uh, between that and the guy that makes uh, pools with a, with a shovel, like all by himself. <laughs> what? <laughs> you, uh, okay. Maybe I've spent more time late night scrolling than I care to admit. Uh, there's like this random Facebook video like series. Oh this no, dude, no. Like, I know what you're talking about. Like, uses He's... like a stick or something and creates like a, a like a little pool oasis situation. Yeah, like, he does. It's, it's it's not even just like a pool. It is like 
he's um uh oh gosh what's it called terraforming he's like terraforming these little like intricate like shockingly intricate mm-hmm. um like vignettes almost it's wild and just seems precarious no last night i was trying to fall asleep and i was in bed and i was watching this video on reddit and it was this truck like u-haul pulling into a um parking garage and immediately like two seconds in the video you see it hit like a big hanging sign that obviously says if you hit this sign do not enter this garage or something like that yep and then they pull forward and they hit a water pipe it just kind of scrapes up at the top so i'm thinking this is the end of the video like this is the embarrassing part of the video yeah yeah, yeah. and instead of just backing up straight they 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 like back up turning and then this dude just guns it forward but the water pipe isn't even the lowest structure in that area there's mm. a lot of low hanging like structural things so like they can't even turn around. They're trying to do like a 42 point turn. It's like, and at one point, one of the guys gets out of the cab and he looks and he never looks above the tires. He's like, what are we hitting? And he never looks up. And this video, Andrew is two minutes long. Eventually they break the water pipe and it starts spewing that black water that comes out of a sprinkler system. uh, When it hasn't been used since it was installed <laughs> and uh oh my god it was two minutes long and i just start dying at one point another car enters the garage and drives around them like <laughs> sucks to suck <laughs> <laughs> it was probably filmed and on I, the 20th of april oh my god <laughs> i sent it to rick because i'm just like cackling in bed i can't i can't help it and then i'm just like sitting there cry laughing while he's watching this video and for some reason, the funniest part to me is at the end. <laughs> it's the end, and I can't even describe it. It's just, it's one of the best. It's, it was art. It was, it brought me so much joy. <laughs> oh my God. Now we're just talking about videos we watched on Reddit. But you don't want to talk about Russian dash cams? Oh, those are fun. I want to get a dash cam just to see what, if I would ever pick up anything bananas. Well, Speaking of Shark Tank, you want to talk about rich people? <laughs> uh, yes. And would you like to sponsor a podcast, listeners? Uh, hit Speaking us of rich up. people. Uh, we have a contact form at getoffsetpodcast.com you can fill out. Um, and we would love to hear from you. We have very affordable and reasonable rates. Also, you can support this podcast at patreon.com slash getoffset for uh, – as little as a dollar a month, you can support the show. At $5, you get access to our super secret Patreon. Discord it is a wonderful place with wonderful humans, and I'm just so happy to be in there as much as I am. We also have merch. Check it out at podcast.com slash merch that you can check out. And uh, you can rate and review this podcast on iTunes. That really helps us out tremendously. We haven't had a fun rating or review in a while, so please leave us a review that will make us laugh. We would appreciate that. But Andrew wants to talk about rich people. I do. So this is something I've been like thinking about a lot, not because of my own finances, but just like thinking about like things I can talk about that I might know a little bit about. And um, this is so stupid. That Phoebe Bridgers guitar smash video really brought to light that there are a lot of misconceptions people have about musicians. And uh, I kind of want to talk about, because I remember one comment said something like, uh, it implied that she would be flying back to LA on a private plane while drinking champagne or something like that. I'm like, hmm, Phoebe Bridges ain't that level of rich. Like private planes are expensive. Like even renting one or... um not commission is it commissioning one like hiring one having like a time share on one or something yeah i'm mad at them oh, so people share them or you can just like hire a random private plane or you Uber can own private, a private jet plane. <laughs> i would be shocked if that didn't exist for rich people uber g6 <laughs> great song uber for lear jets uh, <laughs> um so i just kind of want to talk about like the economics of being 
being a rock star or being a well-known musician. And I think one of my first under one of the first times I really understood that rock stars weren't necessarily rich is I read a book um, written by someone who's a big fan of the band Pavement. Do you know that band, Andrew? No. They were they were big indie in the nineties and they put a lot of great stuff on like Matador Records. I'm a big fan. And this guy was a super fan. And one day he met like he loved Pavement, his favorite band. One day he met the drummer in a bar and he said something like, uh, oh, dude, like he was wasted, obviously, to ask this guy. The sure. question was like, oh, you must be rich, man. And the guy goes, I, I mean, I had, I got enough, made enough money to buy a house. And it right. kind of hit him that just because he loves this music, like there is there is like working musician, like surviving musician, like working actor. Then there's really, really rich. And not a lot of people get to the really, really, really rich part. Um so do you what do you know about how musicians make money? Musicians make money by selling concert tickets. Uh, they make more money by selling merch and they make some money by actual record sales and streams. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there are lots of different revenue streams for musicians. Um, like you said, there, there are live shows. There are, and that's, uh, so there are live shows, there are mechanicals and that's from selling like copies of records, downloads of songs. NFTs. Um, we're not going to talk about NFTs. Just, what, would that that's fall under hard. mechanicals? Yeah, it would fall under mechanicals, merchandising, um, synchronization licenses. So like your music getting mo- used on TV shows and commercials and movies that ca- on podcasts, um, songwriting royalties from like your, your stuff getting pa- played on the music on, on the, the radio, terrestrial radio and live um, bands. Uh, the, only the songwriter gets terrestrial um, royalties uh, for uh, terrestrial radio royalties in the United States uh, for satellite and the rest of the world, the actual performer gets some of that money as well. So let's talk about just like overall, let's start with just overall for everything that a musician makes. If they have a manager and an agent, they pay a percentage of what they make to their manager and agent right. of everything right off the bat. So right away, probably, let's just say 15% of all of the gross revenue you make, gone. Gone to people who help you make more money, but still gone. So right away, you're getting less money. Do you know how concert revenue works? Not particularly. All right. So depending on the band, you either get a door deal or you get a guarantee. A guarantee means they're just probably assuming you sell out the place. They're just paying you a flat fee. They're not going to screw with any other math stuff. Um, and then the venue's going to make their money from like drink sales, etc. And a door deal means you just get a portion of every ticket sold that you have to split with the other performers on the bill after um, the venue rental fee minimum is hit. For example, uh, small small venues might charge 125 bucks so that the sound person gets paid. Right. After that, you get either the whole ticket or a portion of the ticket. So that's how that's that's vaguely how that works. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. I'm, I'm trying to think back. I want to say I remember I went to a show at House of Blues in Anaheim. When I was in college and the band I was there to see was selling their own, their own tickets. Like it, like the singer mailed me the tickets from his place. Yeah. And my understanding at that point in time was that like the venue said, Hey, if you want to play here, that's fine. You have to buy the tickets up front and then you can resell them to your That's fans. pretty, it's called, yeah, that's called pay to play. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's, that's, um, a terrible practice that still exists that should not exist. And I would terrible implore Terrible hiring most fans, practices at Disney? What? <laughs> it's not just Disney that does that, dude. There's like yeah, a yeah, ton yeah. of venues. I think the Rainbow Room where River Phoenix died does that because I had a friend who played there uh, and she had to pay money to play. So, yeah, there are instances, too, especially this is a lot more common with small bands, uh, is that um, to get into these venues, you need to uh, – Buy a certain number of tickets up front, 
and then maybe you'll make money. It's, it's terrible. And, sure. and, and it, there's, there are a lot of ways for bands to get screwed in this regard. So I don't recommend it, but it's, it's something that happens a lot. Um, another thing that venues do that they shouldn't do is uh, they often take 20% of the merch at a show. So your band is there, you're selling your merch that, you know, you're maybe making like 50% on it. Like you're selling a shirt. You, 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 you paid 10 bucks for the shirt. You sell it for 20. Sure. Then the venue comes in and they take 20% of that. Right. Cause you're selling it there. And then your agent and manager come in and they take another cut. Right. And so then let's say you, you, then you're maybe making like, what's, what's the math workout? Like 15% on your own shirts. Is that 50% of the gross or the profit? Profit. Uh, then you're looking at two, $3 right. and 50 cents cut out of the $10 of profit. So you're not six fifty. Something like that. So it's very little money. It, it turns into very little money, very, very, very quickly. Sure. And it's not just small bands who get, screwed out of merch it's a it's like all of them it, it's very very common and it sucks um and it stinks because the band's not getting a portion of the drink sales why right. does the revenue share not work both ways it's a power play from the venue yeah and then sometimes your label wants a cut of that merch as well they want to cut a so I mean, I'm just asking a lot of questions. Um, so sometimes your label takes a cut of your other revenue streams when they used to just take the mechanicals. And let's get let's, now. Let's talk about mechanicals. Let's talk about record sales. Mm -hmm. What do you know about record deals? <laughs> it gets complicated very, very quickly. <laughs> it does. It does. So we should just um, pick an example for like an indie performer, sure, because. Weirdly, as you go to bigger labels, you get a smaller cut. And part of that is because they're like, well, we have uh, marketing departments, publicity departments. Uh, we can help you get more connections. Like they can, they, the idea is they're taking a bigger cut because they ultimately feel like they're doing more work and can sell more records for you. So you would make more money. It doesn't work out that way. But um, there are still indie labels that will do a 50-50 split after recoupables, right? So that means maybe your label fronts you $10,000 for studio time, um, and then they're going to spend $5,000 for your publicist, and then they're running at like $1,000 worth of ads. So that's $16,000 that you have to make back in album sales and mechanicals and streaming before you even get that 50 50 split. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So if you're selling your record at 10 bucks a pop and you have to, and you have to sell $16,000 worth of records before you make any money, that means you have to sell how many, 1600 how many records? records? Yeah. Before you make any money. Right. And that is, uh, that's a low estimate because not only are you recouping your advance, you're recouping marketing expenses. You're recouping the publicist. You're recruit. You're recouping the dinner. Your label took you out to the booze. They got you the gifts. They got you. Right. You're paying for that. <laughs> and then on top of that, more and more labels want to do a three. Well, pretty much all of them now want to do a 360 deal, which means they say, Oh, we're going to help you with your tour. We're going to help you with your merch. Do they help? Maybe, maybe not. But they do want a cut of that money. Sure. So now you're looking at being a musician and all, everybody wants this piece of your already low money because people aren't buying records anymore. People are buying merch, but like how many t-shirts can a person buy? And then right. so many people want a cut of that. So yeah, touring is probably how you're making a bulk of your money. You can't tour right now. And uh, so that gets into synchronization licenses. That's harder to get because everybody wants to get syncs. I want my, I want my mu mu music in, in movies and TV shows. That's where money lives. <laughs> like, sure. so there's a lot of competition for that. And it, when it happens, it just kind of happens to you and you don't 
like you can have like song pluggers, you can have a publishing company that's like working with you and for you. A lot of it's still just a music supervisor either likes you or doesn't like you. Right. Like whoever's making the, doing the soundtrack for a film. Yeah, exactly. And then it's because there's more. Well, yeah, but there, you can cut a slice of pie infinitely. It's just yeah, whether or not can, that slice can. is worth it, is meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. But another thing is um, for musicians, a lot of bands have that main person, that main songwriter. And then there are a lot of singer songwriters who do their own music. They're just singers in all the bands. So if you're someone like Phoebe Bridgers, I'm using her as the example here, it's uh, she has a band that she pays before she gets paid. And that's right. just how it works because your your band because sometimes you can't afford a band and you have to do it yourself because if you're pl- if you if you have a band you need to pay them you need to pay them fairly to keep them on your side because like it's your creative vision and they are a part of it but still your job you are still the boss right and bosses pay other, everyone else before they get paid that's how it's supposed to work it is how it's supposed to work and i know that's not but that's how it's supposed to work and that's still right. how it works typically in music so let's get back to Phoebe Bridgers. Phoebe Bridgers, uh, as an example, is actually, surprisingly, uh, didn't come from money. Like, her family was not wealthy, as happens quite a lot with indie bands. Like, it's, it's, and this is not to, to, to shit on anybody for having, like, a good safety net. I had a really great safety net. Um, and I'm really grateful for it and the opportunities it provided me. But it's something worth acknowledging that it's easier to make it when you have that safety net, when you can be like, I'm not going to have two, a full-time job and a part-time job and then try to pursue music on top of that. It, that makes it a lot easier to create art when you're not worried about losing your home. Right. You know? Yeah. So Phoebe Bridgers didn't come from a lot of money. She released a stranger in the Alps a few years ago. And after that, she could afford a car for the first time in her life in a studio apartment. And that studio apartment is where she lived until months ago when Punisher became a hit. So Punisher was released last year. And a few months ago, she actually was able to move into a house. And that is the level of wealth we're talking about for somebody who's nominated for four Grammys, played Saturday Night Live, is getting cover features in was huge in a magazines. Movie. Was in a movie? Yeah, the the Be- Between Two Ferns movie. There was a Between Two Ferns movie? Yeah, it was really bad, but it was kind of funny. I love Zach Galifianakis. It's funny. I think it falls into the category of like the plot was so bad that like the individual scenes are funny if you're intoxicated. I, as long as you don't care about like how coherent the whole situation is. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, she, she like played, she was like playing a bar gig in the movie. Oh, nice. Yeah. So one thing that helped Phoebe Bridgers a lot is she lucked out and got a spot in an Apple commercial. And that is what kind of enabled her to, <laughs> to pursue music uh, full time. So, I mean, that was that was really cool for her to have. But that's just one example of someone who's a very successful indie artist by all intents and purposes, and she can afford a house. Like, she's not affording a... Like, it's not a private plane. Well, sure. Yeah. So well, that's ha- kind of... Go ahead. I, I guess my question is, is, looking at the evolution of that over time, though, I mean... That's that's a very contemporary example, but if you're looking at just the general cost of living in the United States over the last 20 years and how it's really gone up at a much steeper rate than general wages have gone up, um, I, I guess like would someone of that level of success been able to afford it quite a bit more prior to that? And I'm not sure the answer to that is. I know we had Kathy Valentine on the podcast about this time last year, and she talked about being able to like buy a nice home and whatnot. Uh, from from her job in the Go Go's, but <laughs> for her job in a band that had a number one record back when people still bought right. records and toured with the police. I mean, she did she did well, and she was actually able to live off that money for a very long time. Yeah, um, and with multiple houses and kind of taking a bath on one of those houses. Right, and so 
like it. I, I wouldn't say that they're necessarily similar similar levels of uh, success, but generally in the ballpark. And it money seems going like farther back. Then. Money went a lot farther back then, mm-hmm. so I wonder if that's also part of this dynamic that we're seeing here. So uh, like, I mean, money money used to go a lot farther for sure. Um, and back, especially people used to buy music, so there was more revenue. However, there was also a lot less savvy. There were a lot fewer resources for up and coming musicians and songwriters who didn't want to just get screwed. Right. So there was always the worry, but like, unless you could afford a lawyer who knew what they were talking about, which, you know, even lawyers were harder to find back then. Well, there's you know, not like there's talk- Yelp for lawyers. <laughs> not, not, not back then. But like, you look at, the, I mean, the savvy is a big thing. People got screwed a lot more back then. And uh, you look at the Beatles who uh, like Paul McCartney and John Lennon, they didn't, ha- they didn't have the, the publishing they had unknowingly signed over their, their song rights. Right. So like it was a lot easier for musicians to get screwed. And that's another reason musicians still are often not very wealthy. Um, You have to hit like really, really, really big time to, to start like turning in the money. And a lot of times that money, when, when you really shake it down, it's a lot more upper middle class than it is rich. Well, sure. I mean, yeah. I don't think we're talking like lifestyles of the rich and famous, like Good Charlotte. We're is. not talking about John Legend and Chrissy Teigen, like that kind of rich. Sure, but uh, you know, John. They Legend, were also in the the Between Two Ferns movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I'm sure Chrissy makes you know a lot of money, but John, being an egot, probably makes more. <laughs> I don't know about more. Um, well, she I, just I think most of her revenue, she does some acting. She doesn't really do a lot of modeling anymore. It's her cookbooks. Yep. So it kind of depends on her how her publishing deals on I have at on least that. one of those in my kitchen right now. There's actually some very recipes in there. Um, I've heard that the recipes are great. Yeah, no, it's legit. It's not just like celebrity cookbook by my cookbook. It's all here's how to put salt and pepper on chicken. Like it's really solid. It, it, it's not like Trish Yearwood sharing her Garth Brooks bowl. That's just like, uh, that was on Twitter the other day. And that, no, was, like the, that was weird. Like I, I get into it. And I'm like, oh, that's really creative. And actually like challenges me to expand like how I think about how to use certain things in the kitchen. Um, I just got a delivery from Fender. Do you mind if I go check on that? Sure. I'm going to step out for 30 seconds as well then. He's going to step away too. Do a footnote. All right. We're back. Guess what this is? I'm going to guess that that's the neck from my parts caster. <laughs> I think it might be. And this is a box of other parts we ordered that I would like to open doing a live unboxing um, with. But uh, what else do we have to say about? So uh, so I guess I just kind of want to wrap up that our rock stars rich question. Um, I, I think that the big takeaway there is you, we don't know what these are, these musicians, we don't really know what their finances look like. It would be really, really um unwise and uncool of us to, to make assumptions about whether or not somebody is wealthy or what their money is. It's really none of our business. I sure. can say you, sh- you can look at musicians who have obviously made great decisions for themselves. I think Jason Isbell has made wonderful decisions for his own music as his career started to, to take off. Um, he was part of 30 tigers and that probably means since he's, I think he partly owns that label that would mean that he makes and takes home a lot more money. It's like right. Ani DeFranco owned, started her own record label that she released all of her music on in the nineties called righteous babe records. And when Michael Jackson was bringing home a dollar per record sold, she was bringing home $4 per record sold. Did he sell more than four times the records of Ani DeFranco? Absolutely. Sure. But <laughs> Probably I mean- more like 400 times, but still like, that's how you make a living. I, yeah. I mean, with with a lo- lot of the things around the subject, it, it's never the people that you would expect, like at first glance, looking at the way that things are structured. Um, the same way that like some of the people that you might know in your life that are loaded aren't the people you would necessarily like pick out of your friend group. Like, oh, I had no idea. Um, just yeah. In terms of like financial decision making. 
And I think sometimes the people who like obviously spend the most money on nice and fancy things. Oh yeah. If you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, that means you're almost entirely running on credit. It's like almost a guarantee. Yeah. But one, so as far as like breaking that down, there's a Facebook post going around a couple of years ago that I remember it was like outlining how much it cost for like how much money bands made, like big acts made off of um, venues. Like if you wanted to say, Hey, come play at the arena in my town and how much they make. Yeah. And so I remember like Foo Fighters is making like a quarter million dollars a show, but I'm also looking at them like, yeah, but how many people have their hands in that? How much? Yeah. Have- that's not like them taking home because that's paying. It's not Dave Grohl taking crew? a six figure paycheck every night. No. It's it's really not, and I think Prince Prince pretty famously got a fourteen million dollar check at the end of a tour. Um, he uh, he was playing arenas and he kind of did his own deals, so he did take home he took home a lot more of that than like someone who's working with a big team. Um, I think that's something a smart a lot of musicians do is they curate these smaller teams to do the stuff for them so they can you know, focus on creating music, but by hiring this team, they're not selling futures in a, in a way they're not going into debt with a label in, in a way, because you're literally going into debt with some labels. If you're accepting big advances and sometimes the big advance is worth it because it enables you to create stuff that's better sounding, maybe more adventurous. Sure. Than I mean, there's something to be said have. for like, you've got to have money to make money in, in yeah, any yeah. industry. Yeah, and if you get a big advance, part of that really is like the assumption that you quit your job and you just this is your job now. You do this full time. It's basically an advance on a salary, and then you have to make that back. So if you're able to, you know, not not I wouldn't say a personal loan would be the way to go, but if you're able to save up money to do your own studio time, to hire your own teams, you're always going to make more money. That being said, there are still a lot of advantages for younger bands to have labels. And that's mostly that it's it's insane to think that you, I, I shouldn't say that. It's wild to think that you could do all that yourself unless you have a lot of experience. <sighs> yeah. You're muted. Shall we do some unboxing? Let's do some unboxing. Good. No address. I'm like, did I just flash my address? I feel like it's the law now that whenever I do an unboxing, I have to say, I have a big old box. It's the law. It's a moderately sized box, I would say. It's a medium box. I have another box out there from Fender, but I'm going to save that unboxing video for the YouTube channel. Oh. Picking favorites, are we? Well, no, this is for both of us, and that's just for me, and I think it'll be funny. Let's see. What do we have? We have bubble wrap. The modern bubble wrap. Right. Oh, yeah. That's from the, the Thin Line series. Yes. We have tuning machines. We have more tuning machines. We have back plates. Obviously, Andrew and I both got a bunch of back plates. We're, we're building things. We are building things. Things and stuff. And stuff and things. And that's it. That was all that was in this box was tuning machines and uh, back plates. <laughs> that sounds about right. All right. I thought that would be more exciting. Well, I think then, I wonder if people were hoping for more exciting, but. Then I, I, I think we have no choice but to uh, open up the neck. This is more exciting. I, this is completely unplanned, but I'm also really excited. This actually is is unplanned. I can imagine this seeming contrived, but this was just really good timing. Like normally FedEx comes way late in the day and I had been, the app said that I wouldn't, this wouldn't be delivered until tomorrow. So. Okay. I did that one wrong. So this should be, if they sent the right one, the all Rosewood. Stratocaster neck that I'm going to put it on Jazz Master Body. <laughs> They're similar enough. With okay. the uh, strat pickups. Let's see. Is this? Ooh. 
Genuine Fender, Fender replacement. Genuine. Let's see. Pop. Hopefully pop, that wasn't. The, hopefully that wasn't the truss rod. It's just the tape. Ow! I think I just got a paper cut. That's unfortunate. Yes. Occupational hazard, I suppose. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, I can't do it. I can't do the sound. No. Okay. It's. I apologize. Oh my god. Let me know when. I, I'll, I'll put my headphones back on when it's out. Ooh, that's nice. Look at that. Oh wow, Andrew. It's like embossed. It's like actually. Yeah, embossed. it's like slightly laser engraved in. Yeah, I think embossed is the word. At least pre-slotted nut. Yep. And I've got files where I can I can take that down myself. Oh man, yeah, that is smooth. The tall skinny frets on there. They're tall, yeah. Which I love. I love those frets so much. I'm not nice. a fan of uh, medium jumbo whatsoever. Yeah, this is really nice. I like that. Wow. I, I, when, my my fear with getting that getting it is uh, there's there would be a lot of figuring, and I know some people really love like a heavy figuring on a rosewood. I just love just like that deep chocolate brown. No, that's that's not too heavily figured. No, that's perfect. That's like just enough definition for me to be excited about, but not so yeah. much for me like eh. a little bit of red. Wow, no, yeah, that looks nice. great. Wow. Good job. I'm pretty excited. You should be. To quote Ariana concerned. Grande, thank you, next. Thank you for going so long in that episode without having another joke after I asked you to please stop. I figured I'd give it, you know, what is give it? Give it another try. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, it was too much. 40 minutes, I, I think, is, is enough cool down period. That was a good cool down period. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was... Not feeling it. Well, I appreciate the apology. I think we both should apologize to each other, but sometimes we get grumpy, you know, it happens. It does. But I don't know what to do with this box now. I almost just flew a knife across the room. That could have been hazardous. Hazardous to say, to say the least, to say the least. So what do you got planned for the rest of your day? Uh, well, now it's coming to get a neck. Um, <laughs> but also half seriously, we are heading up to the northern area for a uh, family get together. Uh, so we nice. might, I don't know if we'll end up driving past your neighborhood, but if we do, I might have to swing by. And bring back my yeah, I've got the, buzz. It's sitting literally right there. I have a box with a bunch of crap in it for you. A DOD pedal, um, some other pedals. I, I went, I found the, so I set the Benson, set the Benson fuzz aside when I was moving rooms and I went to yeah. open up, make sure everything was, was inside and it was missing the, uh, the printout that the instructions were like, Oh no. And so I spent like 30 minutes looking for it through like all the stacks of papers and the random, like eight different stacks of papers I had in my office. I found it. Oh, good. So, I'm glad you found it. It's all back together now. I also found hey. my Night Sky um, insert because they're they're in the same spot. So I was playing with them together. The Night Sky ins insert? Uh, the Night Sky, the pamphlet printout. Oh, the pan. What yeah, a, I actually what do we had call that? a pamphlet. The manual? In manual instructions. Recommended I feel, settings. I feel like manual sounds really complicated, but I also think that that's fair terminology for the night sky yeah i think yeah cool well um that's all i got uh i'm probably gonna film a demo with the yvette young signature nice. guitar i don't know yet if i will release that on monday or later this week because um 
I don't know. I'm trying to experiment with my posting schedule. Like it's just, it's hard for me to do premieres on Mondays because I have lots of calls those days and they're not yep. always predictable as far as scheduling goes. Yep. So uh, I think I might try to do more like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday schedule. Also, we're on TikTok now. Did you know? I did notice that. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I could bring myself to put it on my phone, but yeah. That's fair. It's Maybe interesting. It's... My first video got like a ton of traction and I'm, I'm getting a lot of followers <laughs> right now, Good. but uh, yeah, I, oh boy. I'm going to shut down my computer before. Is that a storm? I didn't even think like it drizzled a little bit last night. Maybe it's was just... that lightning. No, that was the, my power flickering. Okay, yeah. Well, everybody out there, thanks for watching. Thanks for understanding. Thanks for listening, until, watching. Under Yeah, all of the above. Until next, yeah, until next time, my name is Emily. My name is Andrew. Goodbye. Bye.